Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I think Selena for uh, hitting record. Um, and uh, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody to the Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement uh, lecture series or seminar series. Um, it's my great privilege to uh, introduce in just a moment the fantastic speaker that we have uh, joining us from uh, virtually from North Carolina today. Um, just as a reminder, this is a series that we have as part of the uh, Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement to bring in both internal and external uh, uh, experts, uh, thought leaders, uh, provocateurs of all types to help us uh, think deeply about uh, improvement um, and to push really to push the thinking. And so uh, there will be no exception to that today. We're very delighted with our, our speaker. Um, just a, a quick reminder before we introduce Dr. Shannon, um, uh, if you're able to, we do appreciate uh, if you can turn your video on. Um, we understand maybe in between uh, bites that you, you may want to turn it off temporarily, but if you can, uh, it is helpful to have your video on. Um, and we're okay watching people eat lunch. I think we're, we're all, all right with that at this point. Um, and uh, just so you know, this will be a, um, we want this to be as interactive and Dr. Shannon has asked that this be as interactive as possible. Um, so uh, he'll have some time to present his thoughts um, and then we'll have uh, plenty of time for discussion. So please write down your questions or your comments or your thoughts. Um, you can put them in the chat or you can save them till afterwards and we'd love to have a really rich dialogue after uh, Dr. Shannon presents. Um, uh, Lisa or Lane, anything else to uh, give for, by way of background or housekeeping before we dive in? I don't think so, David. Okay, great. All right, thank you, Lane, and thanks, Lisa. Um, okay, with that, then I will introduce our speaker, Dr. Rick Shannon, uh, who joins us from Duke Health in North Carolina, where he serves as the Chief Quality Officer, overseeing all the quality and safety programs across the health system. Uh, Dr. Shannon is an absolute uh, icon in quality and safety, uh, nationally and internationally, uh, as well as in uh, academic medicine in general. Um, he received his bachelor's degree in biology from Princeton University and his medical degree from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. He completed his training in internal medicine at Beth Israel Hospital and his cardiovascular medicine training at MGH, uh, both in Boston, as you know. Um, after fellowship, he joined the faculty at MGH before uh, accepting a professor position at Drexel University. Uh, he was called upon to be the chair of the Department of Medicine at Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh and then subsequently the chair of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and then prior to joining Duke, Dr. Shannon was the executive vice president for health affairs at the University of Virginia, where he uh, led the medical center in helping to transform the organization into uh, really a premier healthcare provider in the state and uh, one uh, across the country. Uh, Dr. Shannon is a national thought leader in quality and safety serving on a number of uh, national organizations and boards, uh, including the, uh, the Institute of Healthcare Improvement. Uh, he's on the board of directors for the Kaiser Foundation. He's a director of the National Institutes of Health and, and uh, we could go on. Um, he's especially focused on transforming organizations to decrease waste, to improve quality and safety, and to create a more respectful and supportive uh, work environment for the providers. So. With that, I'm going to cut it short. I could go a lot longer, but we'd rather hear from Dr. Shannon than perhaps about him. So thank you so much. Please joining me in extending a special Stanford welcome to Dr. Rick Shannon. David, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get us teed up here. Can you see my screen? Oh, let me. Can you see oh, me? Yes. Yep, okay. looks good. Terrific. Um, so uh, th thanks for uh, having me today. I I I'm thrilled to be here, and it's it's great to be part of uh, uh, a conversation with such a distinguished group of of um, uh, providers and thought leaders in the field of quality. I thought I would take the opportunity to really learn from you um, and ask this kind of rhetorical question: Is it time to reimagine the clinical quality and patient safety systems in America? And uh, this is obviously been a journey for a while. On the left is Hippocrates, who 2,000 years ago uh, admonished us uh, about our professional duty to do no harm. And then perhaps a little more recently, uh, 
in the latter half of the 20th century, we had the Institute of Medicine's work around crossing the quality chasm. Now, 20 years later, the question is, how far have we come? Where are we going? And is there a time to really think about um, how we might uh, reimagine uh, quality and safety uh, in American medicine? Um, as David mentioned, I've had the pleasure to sit on a number of boards, two interesting ones. You know, the NIH Clinical Center is the largest hospital in America devoted exclusively to research. And understanding clinical quality in a research hospital is a really fascinating undertaking. Um, and then I, I also chair, uh, sit on the board and chair the quality committee for Kaiser Health Plan and Hospitals. Um, I think those guys are pretty well known to you. Um, an interesting example of what an integrated health system can do in the space of quality. So I'm gonna begin uh, with this notion that where I started 20 years ago when I first started to get interested in quality, parenthetically, for those of you that are somewhere earlier in your career, you know, I was a card carrying cardiologist running an NIH funded laboratory um, uh, as the chair of medicine at Allegheny General Hospital and then had the occasion to meet Paul O'Neill who was then the CEO of Alcoa and it transformed Alcoa um, using lean management principles. And I became a student of Paul O'Neill's and uh, that totally changed uh, my career uh, for the last 20 years. So what do I mean by this idea of, are we able to be learning organizations? Well, you guys know this well. Um, uh, academic medical centers in particular are infatuated with reportable, but not always actionable data. Um, that we, I think, are increasingly awash in meaningless measures, by which I mean our ability to measure so far outpaces our ability to improve that our team members become overwhelmed with measures. Uh, in most instances, organizations have not developed a common discipline problem solving approach, so that results tend to meander, oftentimes subject to the Hawthorne effect. That's fascinating, right? We belong in our case to these two learned organizations, two of the nation's greatest universities. And yet most people in the care delivery system have little time to learn. And we certainly know that the keys to certain management systems such as lean are about the idea of continuous learning as the basis for continuous improvement. And then we've got this problem of working harder and harder uh, believing that will be successful, but largely engaging what, you know, has been talked about in the Harvard Business Review as the idea of active um, inertia, where systems tend to continually repeat the established behaviors that they've operated in. So all of these things, I think, have served, even over the last 20 years, to somewhat constrain academic medicine from taking its rightful place in leading quality and patient safety to even greater heights than have been achieved. And you know, it's this sort of interesting cartoon that Bob Golden, who's the dean at, who was the dean at Wisconsin, shared with me. You know, healthcare continues to be this have and have nots, right? So you can pick your party, but we might think of the people in the bow as the insurers and we in the stern bailing away as the providers. And you could imagine different other analogies. But the reality is the ship of the US healthcare system is taking on water. And whether you're in the bow or in the stern, the problem remains ours to begin to think about, certainly with a great deal more urgency than I think we have. So let me give you an example of what I mean about this sort of infatuation with measurement. So this is data from when I was the executive vice president at UVA. Um, interesting, I've been at um, Duke for almost 20 months, um, and I've yet to actually put my finger on how many measures we report, and I'm the quality chief. And I haven't quite put together all the expenses associated with it, but this I knew at UVA. We reported 484 measures every year to 11 different agencies. And you can say, yes, UVA, sort of a public university, maybe that's why we had so many. Really only two of those agencies were, you know, agencies that, that, that really had to do with the Commonwealth of Virginia. We spent close to $17 million a year on operating expenses to have this quality measurement system. We dutifully reported on all of them, but we focused on improving just a few of them, right? In any given year, we might pick five or six things to focus on, and it would take us four or five years to really master them. 
And of course, the, the height of irony was we reported mortality to eight different reporting agencies, and yet we were characterized by four different rates of mortality. Now, if there's anything incontrovertible, it's death, right? So this notion that a different report can characterize your mortality in different ways is sort of the height of the, you know, to which now the measurement systems go, uh, largely creating confusion. And this is an example from when I was at Penn. Um, as David mentioned, I was the chairman of medicine at Penn. Um, and you know what would happen at Penn, this is a, an old UHC report that, that's now Visient. But what would happen at Penn, you can see here our expected mortality in yellow and our observed mortality in blue. And we'd get to a point where the observed to expected mortality ratio approached each other, we would panic and rather than change our practice to reduce observed mortality, we would hire more coders to sit in the basement of some 250 year old building at Penn and figure out how to get more information out of the electronic medical record. So we looked like our expected mortality should be higher. This sort of game playing that is embedded in these complex metrics is unfortunately a lot of what the quality system has become. So literally we would hire billers and coders to fix a mortality problem rather than think about our care delivery system and how it was contributing. That leads me to my next cartoon, right? Um, he's one tough cookie. I've never seen anyone bounce back from an autopsy. The idea that after a patient died, some biller or coder could figure out a way to make them look better is the height to which some of the absurd practices have escalated. And now, now look, Penn's a pretty good place. Um, so, you know, but this is the kind of stuff that sometimes has underpinned the quality effort to date. And then finally, of course, um, I can say this in your presence because both Duke and Stanford perform very well in these public reports. But the reality is to most of the public, this is an unobtainable result. And we know that, at least not in Stanford's case and not so much in Duke's case, but there are often inconsistencies between how groups perform in these various different public reports. And today, of course, is US News Day, right? Um, and one can look you know, across four or five of these different reports and recognize whether or not there's consistency in performance. And obviously they each use different measurement systems. But you know, I think this was called out by um, Matt Austin and Peter Pronovost uh, when they wrote this article in Health Affairs a number of years ago, where they looked at those four public reports and concluded that no hospital rated as high performing by what was rated as high performing by all four national rating systems. Only 10% of 844 hospitals rated as high performing by one rating system were rated as high performing by other by another. So, and, and, and really what's important about this is the fact that most Americans cannot afford nor have access to the honor roll hospitals. So if we use this as the example and leave the rest of our healthcare provider systems without the opportunities and tools and methods to improve and shame them, I believe we do a great disservice. And I would argue we need a much more equanimable way to think about quality as we go forward. So the, the point of my, my discussion with you is to say that I think there is an interesting way we could reimagine quality. I'm gonna share with you Duke's early journey into this. But I think on the left-hand side, you see the way quality is defined today. It is almost exclusively based, based upon insurance claims data. And I think all of you know as providers that there are moments where the way things get coded are not exactly the way we saw them as a clinician. Almost all the measures are defined by payers and regulators. The retrospective nature of the data makes it impractical to use when actually considering real-time improvement opportunities. So the US News and Row report out today captures 2017 through 2019. CMS star ratings actually report how you performed in 2018, not how you perform in 2021. So the idea that one measures, quote, quality in this total retrospectoscope is antithetical to what 
Robert Deming, or, or, uh, Deming and many, many people spoke of when they talked about real-time quality engineering. And of course, I think increasingly we are now aware that these measures are blind to social determinants and totally indifferent to issues of health disparities. So what could the quality system look like? I think we could build a quality system that's actually based upon clinical outcomes, clinical data, pulled in real time using data science capabilities that your organization and mine uh, are working steadfastly on. I think we have to return quality back to the providers. I don't know about at Stanford, but many of my frontline team members say, you know, you can hand me all those NHSN definitions, they make no sense to me. I know what a clinical outcome should be when it comes to colorectal surgery. I can define it in 12 dimensions, and yet no one's particularly interested in that characterization. I think we have to develop more real-time ways to assess our quality because if we're not engineering quality into care delivery as it's, as it's delivered, then in fact, we're not doing quality at all. I think that data science affords us an opportunity to get much better at deeper clinical phenotypes informed by social determinants that can be captured in real time. And I think there is an opportunity to use those platforms to identify and eradicate inequities. And I would submit to you that I think academic medical centers have an opportunity right now in the wake of the troubling issues of racial inequality that have been brought forth in the last year to really refocus our times on what should quality look like in the next 20 years. So the way Duke is thinking about this is uh, through our Duke quality system, and this is much like the work that you guys do in, in your center, um, we are looking to develop, implement, and execute a knowledge system and attitudes approach to create this notion of perfect patient care, which we describe as providing what a patient wants and needs on time the first time, no inequity, no error, um, and no waste. To us, that is the aspirational goal. And it embedded in this, we believe our elements in care redesign that we can focus on to deliver the idea of perfect patient experience. So we have two goals. Um, one is to eliminate harm to our patients and to our team members. I'll come back to that and why we still focus on harm. And then this idea to define, measure, and improve clinical outcomes along our clinical service deliveries. Now, at this point, this conversation, or, or soon this conversation, is going to sound a lot like Brent James. And I think Brent has really been ahead of his time, as is true um, you know, of, of almost his entire career, because Brent has long called forward the fact that the way to think about quality is within the care delivery system, not to use these complex measures that are normalized using uh, really difficult to understand epidemiologic definitions, but rather to simply go to clinicians and say, what's the expected outcome here and how do we vary? Uh, so that's basically what we'll talk a little bit about for the next few minutes. Oops. So um, the Duke quality system is based on lean principles. Uh, those of you familiar with lean, I know many of you are, will recognize the Shingo uh, model that we uh, use as the adopted form of lean. Um, and each of our model areas, which are our service lines, has a work system to establish standard work and care delivery, has a management system, which is the system by which we communicate our results and our opportunities for improvement, and then an improvement system directed by a lean trained coach that's involved in using the lean principles to drive the work systems. So that's the construct that we have developed here. We're using each of our service lines as what we call model areas and spending really this first couple of years in what we call people development. So we need to provide people with the capabilities to be able to see and solve problems. So lots of education, lots of rapid improvement events, lots of exercises underway to try and build capabilities in our team members so that we can in, eventually engage in continuous improvement. So why are we focused on this idea of clinical outcomes? Well, I think it's based in this slide, which tells this daunting tale that has been true for the last 20 years. And as best I can tell is gonna be true for at least another decade. And that is in the US healthcare system, 
20% of the population accounts for 80% of the spend. And that 20% of the population is in our organizations. People that come to academic medical centers with complex chronic conditions and consume vast resources in attempts often vainly to restore health. And the reality is that it's been true for the last 20 years and as best I can tell, will persist for the next five years, at least the next five years and probably the next decade. So if we can't figure out a way to repurpose and improve the complex chronic care model that currently consumes these resources, there is no amount of focus on value that can correct the US healthcare system. And of course, this is Andy Hackbark and Don Berwick's account of the notion that at least uh, you know, uh, $1.1 trillion of what we currently spend in the US healthcare system is embedded in waste. And they've broken this down nicely. And if you look at the right-hand side of this slide, you can see that nearly a half a billion dollars of the waste in the healthcare system, as broken down by, uh, by Don Berwick, is consumed in clinical waste defined by misdiagnosis, delay in diagnosis, complications, and redos. So nearly half of what Hackbarth and Berwick define as the opportunity to repurpose waste is consumed in our clinical care delivery systems. And that's why we have chosen to focus on clinical outcomes and care delivery as the emphasis for our lean management system. Now, nonetheless, I think we do need to continue to pay attention to quality. Uh, because it is our moral obligation, right? It is unassailable. It violates that Hippocratic duty that we, we uh, claim oath to. Um, it is the most elementary form of waste. And I think one of the things we have uh, observed over the last 20 years is it certainly can be reduced uh, if not eliminated. And of course, it is a, a quintessential form of waste. These are probably some dated numbers, but nonetheless continue to approach the kind of things we see, particularly as we expand definitions of what harm is. But here's the interesting piece, and I, uh, I gave you a clue to this early on, but you know, on, the, on this uh, lower left panel is uh, the Georgetown, Kentucky Alcoa illuminating plant where they make hot molten metal uh, with uh, vats at 2000 degrees uh, over two football field length uh, industrial floors where the average uh, education of the workforce in Georgetown, Kentucky is less than a high school education. And this is one of our US News and World Report honor roll hospitals, right? And of course the question even today is which is safer to work in the Georgetown, Kentucky Alcoa aluminum plant or to be in one of our hospitals. And of course it continues to be 10 times safer to work at Alcoa than to work in a US hospital. Now this used to be 27 times. So we have made progress, but it's still 10 times safer to make aluminum than to make clinical care. And this comes from the time when I was at Penn and I served on Governor Rendell's uh, Pennsylvania Healthcare Toss Containment Council. In Pennsylvania, uh, healthcare organizations had to report their public, uh, publicly report their hospital acquired conditions. Uh, this is a summary of that data set. What you see here is that there are about 2 million people admitted to, Pen to Pennsylvania's 163 hospitals. 23,287 people got a hospital-acquired uh, infection. And here you see them here. A bunch of people got two or more infections. Um, interestingly enough, surgical site infections was the highest number. That continues to be the case today. But then when you look across and began to ask the question, what are the consequences of these infections in Pennsylvania? What you see is that care that was complicated by hospital acquired condition had an in-hospital mortality of 9.4% compared to people with the same DRGs who didn't get an infection where the mortality was 1.8%. The average length of stay, 22 days compared to five. The average readmission rate, 40% compared to 16%. If you want to fix your readmission rate, reduce your hospital acquired conditions. And here's the showstopper, the average Medicare expenditure per, ca per case, $20,000 compared to $6,000. Now that $13,600 uh, difference or more 
times 23,287 infections amounted to $324 million a year in Pennsylvania consumed yeah. on just these sources of waste. So unquestionably, this is an opportunity to repurpose resources and reclaim lives as part of an improvement method. This is early work from Duke. We have moved away from virtually all normalized data and report individual cases across our health system here uh, based upon average data per month and then our performance. In 2019, we started the lean quality journey. So uh, beginning in 2020, just before the pandemic broke, we implemented the lean management system. You can see in a lot more green in the second half of the year than red. What we were actually able to do was reduce the number of harms by 360, which was the largest total reduction in harms ever experienced at Duke, a 36% reduction in a single year using the lean method. We used our model areas. This is five, this is roughly four years work of Duke data. So between fiscal year 17 and 18, we reduced harms by 7%. Between 18 and 19, we reduced harms by 5%. In fiscal year 20, uh, in between 19 and 20, we implemented the first phase of the due quality system, beginning with visual management, our management system, and we saw an 18% improvement. And then 20 and 21, we saw a 32% improvement. Then we began to use our swarms, our model spell, cells and hotspots. I want to call out two areas in particular, 60s east at Duke University Hospital is the 38 bed medical intensive care unit, ground zero for COVID. We uh, had census of 250 patients in our hospital and the peak of the COVID have seen more than 6,000 patients, most of whom uh, had some time in the medical ICU. In the same time we were experiencing COVID, we saw a 58% reduction in harms bloodstream infections, urinary tract infections, C. diff, pressure injuries in the medical intensive care unit, and an 87% reduction in the uh, 30, I'm sorry, the 26 bed coronary care unit. So you can apply the principles of lean to the reduction in harms and see dramatic improvements in fairly traditional places in an organization. I will point out to you that in fiscal year 21, the medical intensive care unit 36 beds has since has gone some 420 days without a C. diff infection in the throes of COVID. So these methods are quite sustainable even under extenuating circumstances. This is just an aggregate of the improvements we've seen, 95 deaths. We think there's a possibility to reclaim 20,000 patient days. And uh, we've already realized about 8 million of what we think is about $32 million in uh, opportunity costs associated with this. Now, where we're moving in clinical outcomes is using existing professional data registry. So much like Stanford, Duke participates in all of the big professional data registries. In fact, at Duke, we have 77 data registries, clinical data registries where information is abstracted from the electronic medical record, adjudicated and risk adjusted by a professional society, in the case of NISQIP, the American College of Surgeons, and then fed back and, and benchmarked against peers. So we have begun to use the NISQIP data at Duke as the basis for our improvement. So it is clinical data, which resonates with the surgeons rather than administrative data. The standardized definitions are well received and professionally adjudicated. We have data that's out to 30 days postoperatively. We include 13 different, I'm sorry, complications. It's all risk adjusted. And this data is now used to drive improvement. More importantly, the data is used to assess risk. So we use the NISQIP risk scores to both establish what should be the standard for length of stay and to understand the individual patient's risk relative to the average risk at Duke for a, given, uh, for a given procedure. That information is acted upon by the surgeon, a decision is made to perform the procedure, and then the results are evaluated. So this is Duke University Hospital uh, up until June of 2020. 
Uh, we'll have the, 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 we just got the recent report. I didn't update it, but this is for overall surgical cases at Big Duke. And you can see this is morbidity and mortality, the complication rates of all different types. You can see what the observed to expected ratio is. That's a professionally adjudicated. You're likely all familiar with this. Then you see what adjusted percentile Duke performs in compared to 800 other uh, participating centers and what the adjusted quartile is. Then you know, based upon Duke data, the average cost per complication. You also understand that using this data and sharing it with surgeons, we've actually seen a significant overall reduction in complications leading to a significant improvement in margin. And then you can stratify this based upon individual surgeon data. So this is an individual surgeon's performance, his 38 colorectal cases uh, compared to 226 performed in that particular discipline, the average length of stay, the median mortality, um, the overall cost for this surgeon of about $13,000 per case and OR materials of 2,600 compared to his or her peers. So this is the Brent James construct, right? Take information that is valuable to the surgeon or to the provider, stratify it, use it as a basis for comparison and improve. Now I wanna then turn the last moments to the issue of equity. You are all familiar with this, what I consider to be haunting quote from Martin Luther King. Uh, of all the forms of inequity, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and humane. Well, I'm sure like at Stanford, at Duke, we have really spectacular health services researchers, and they have contributed mightily to the national recognition that people of color have worse outcomes in America than white people do. The question is, what's Duke's contribution to those data? So over the last year, we have, we have focused our lean management system on answering this question. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in Duke healthcare, our disparities are the most shocking and inhumane. This is the project we call Looking in the Mirror. What contribution does Duke make to the two to threefold higher mortality that a person of color experiences in America compared to a white person? So we've established this collaborative for advancing clinical health equity. Um, it begins with community partnerships. I'll talk about Born in Durham, Healthy for Life, which is a group of uh, non-for-profit organizations in Durham. Just so you know, Durham is a majority minority community. 39% of the Durham community is African-American, 14% is Latinx. So that makes whites a minority in Durham. Um, and so these community organizations are made up principally of people of color. Uh, we use the county health rankings and the community health assessments as the basis for the determination of what we're going to work on. Every one of the CACHE working groups has a community partnership that informs it. Then there are internal structures to Duke, the chancellor's program called Moments to Moments, the university's program of Durham Affairs, and then RCTSA, which is focused exclusively on community health and well being, run by Ebony Bulware. We then reach out to clinical service lines and ask them to participate. And here are four of the service lines that were the inaugural ones. So each one of these service lines has a community sponsor and a university sponsor that sits with them and develops the measure that, or measures that are going to be used to look at our clinical outcomes. So in this case, we're looking at maternal morbidity, infant mortality, hypertension, colorectal screening, atrial fibrillation, and pain management. We use our data science capabilities to measure each of these outcomes over a five-year period and stratify them by age, race, gender, comorbidities, insurance status, a neighborhood deprivation index, and a patient-reported outcome. Each of these working groups is provided project management data sourcing, data analytic capability, and measurement development capability. These are resources that the health system provides, and they then morph into further um, advanced clinical decision supports and predictive modeling capabilities so that we're identifying clinical outcomes disparities and then examining metadata to look for factors that drive those disparities using statistical modeling and statistical analysis to try and understand factors 
that are most influential in accounting for this. Then we go back to the care delivery system. So Duke is fortunate to have a program funded through the uh, Office of Minority Health at the NIH, where we are focused on building cultural competency in providers. Our change management and lean management systems work with our clinical delivery system to incorporate changes in care delivery that are found to underpin the disparity. And then we go back to the community and create equitable healthcare outcomes and focus on increased life years. So these are the capabilities that we provide the working groups. These include experts in health policy and economics, our data governance group, data integration and operability, using much of the same data science capabilities that you guys have. Here is one of the Tableau dashboards. This is looking at maternal morbidity and mortality over five years. You can see women who delivered at Duke who had no complications, and then the five-year aggregate number of complications in each of these different categories. You can see the highest number actually is acute renal failure and DIC and eclampsia and sepsis. Uh, interestingly, not conventional cardiovascular complications. If you break this data down, these are the 30,000 women that gave birth. You can see the average age overall and by different ethnic groups, really no difference. You see the gestational age of the babies born. Take a look at BMI, fascinating, right? White women, 33, African-American women, average BMI, 44, Latinx, 34, Asian, 28. This is their multiply. You can see here their insurance status, which we collect. Note the substantial increase in Medicaid-insured individuals among African-Americans, uh, but that's actually dwarfed by uh, our Hispanic and Latino population compared to whites. So whites largely commercially insured, um, African-Americans largely insured by Medicaid. So we begin to see a disparity um, both in body weight and in insurance status. And then you look at events, these are the total number of mortalities. It turns out African-American women don't have a higher maternal mortality index, but they have a twofold higher rate of morbid events. You can see here 4.83% versus 2.6% and 2.52% in uh, Latinx. So then you drill down on what those comorbidities are. And you see, as I pointed out, African-Americans are almost too far more likely to have renal failure substantially higher incidence of preeclampsia and sepsis. Then you, look at their co then you look at their social determinants and you can see that African-Americans also uh, tend to have a much higher portion of food insecurity, housing insecurity, transportation problems and financial insecurity. Then you sit down with the community groups and you get questions like this. What would maternal care at Duke look like if it was designed by a black woman? So what that then turns our attention to is the facts that at Duke, uninsured women in our community are actually cared for by the public health um, office in Durham through the first through, uh, two th trimesters of pregnancy. In the third trimester, the woman's care is transferred to Duke. So we don't know these women for the first two trimesters, and then they arrive in the third trimester. So they arrive in the third trimester, and what we discovered is 55% of these women almost all of them Latinx and African-American, uninsured, arrive, and only 55% of them were coming to their third trimester visits. We couldn't figure it out. Turns out the bus schedule was the major determinant of whether or not a woman could get make it to an appointment. And when we adjusted our clinic schedule to accommodate the bus schedule, now 85% of women make it to their third trimester appointment. We recognized that hypertension was the, uh, the leading indicator for those comorbid conditions, particularly acute renal failure. So now we have embarked, like many of you already do, on remote patient monitoring around high-risk African-American women uh, during the course of their pregnancy. We have created care coordination for all women who have a comorbid condition to make sure that those morbidities are, are managed during pregnancy. We have used our Duke REACH program to create a um, Duke-wide program and culturally competent midwives. We have created a volunteer doulas program to make sure these moms have adequate postnatal care. And then we're embarking on this process of to be understood. Most women of color in Durham actually believe they'll get a good, they'll get good care at Duke. 
They just don't think we, we care about them. They're not worried about our competence. They're worried about whether we actually care about them, whether we understand them, whether we're committed to recognizing how life is for them. So I'm gonna stop. Patients and providers need to take quality back from payers and regulators, period, full stop. Providers take care of sick patients, but we as leaders have a responsibility for fixing our sick systems. And the third thing I think we need to keep in mind as we move forward is that I don't think you can have a remarkable patient experience unless we create the circumstances where our caregivers have a remarkable experience. Okay, I'm gonna shut this down and now let you guys go at it, right? But those are at least some ideas, I think about what a future and quality could look like. Well, thank you so much, Rick. That was fantastic. Um, and uh, it certainly got me thinking and I'm sure got our group thinking. Um, I'm, I am I'd love to hear uh, questions. And so does anyone have a, want to come forward with a question? I've got a whole list of questions this long, so there won't be any lack of discussion. Um, but if anyone wants to jump in, um, while people are raising their hand, they're starting to formulate in the chat. Uh, we did have one comment, I think, that was more kind of internal. Um, actually, no, let's, let's go to Karthik. You know, Karthik, do you want to give uh, quickly summarize your, your question that you had? Sure. Thank you, David. Yeah, so I'm the um, pediatric NISQIP surgeon champion here at our children's hospital. And um, I was really impressed with how you guys are using the NISQIP data to drive improvement. That's obviously how NISCOOP is designed, but we've had a lot of trouble getting buy-in from people beyond kind of people in the surgical specialties because the outcomes that are measured are not super relevant to them. So I was just curious to know um, how you guys have approached that. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. So um, first of all, uh, we have, I think now leave cardio and thoracic aside and vascular side, we have eight surgical specialties participating in NISCOOP, um, including our pediatric surgeons. Um, but they were the last to come in. Uh, and it took a, um, you know, we, we had to, I think, show that we could use the data to really drive improvement in some of these other specialty areas, particularly general surgery, before people began to believe that it could be applicable. Um, but we have now seen in the last year or two some significant improvements. We, and I'll be honest with you, we had less than optimal performance in some of our pediatric surgical outcomes. Uh, so, you know, there's a little bit of reluctance that we, they were being called out, but now they've virtually picked up in all the domains. But I think that your question points to this issue I didn't really touch on that's an important one. And that is, there are many surgical disciplines for which a clinical outcome like mortality may not be the right thing. Think of ENT, right? I mean, other than head and neck cancer, most otolaryngologists aren't dealing with life and death. So we're trying to build uh, we're in the process of trying to build with some of our social scientists patient reported outcomes in those domains. Now, the otolaryngology societies actually have professionally adjudicated patient reported outcomes for things like hearing loss and vocal cord stuff. And so we're trying to see in those areas where morbidity, mortality, and surgical site infections may not make sense, can we begin to build a repository of patient reported outcomes? In other words, was my voice restored? Was my hearing improved? Did the vertigo get better, right? Just some, some more formal assessments of the patient's experience, but that's work underway and we don't have really good data on that yet. Um, if I could maybe follow up on that. Thanks, thanks, Karthik. Um, Rick, I, I, it really strikes me. I really loved to see uh, your mini slides where it was just you know one set of data after another. Um, and it seems to me that your conversations and your improvement efforts are really structured around data um, and that it you know as, as I think we recognize the power of having those conversations when it's around data is a totally different conversation than in the absence of data so I'd love to hear you say more about that and then how do you get to the point what, what do you what's your magic sauce to get to the point where you have the data and you, you're able to deliver on that goal yeah so uh, David I think I would just add a little um, suffix to what you said data that matters, to providers and patients. So here's the problem. And this, I encountered this you know, at UVA. Let's take surgical site infections, just take an example. Our surgeons do not agree with the NSHN definition of surgical site infections, right? They just say, you don't, it's not right. It's an epidemiologic definition. Um, 
we have a professionally adjudicated definition. I'll give you an example. If, uh, and I don't know if this happens in Palo Alto, but it happens in Durham, regrettably. If you come in with a gunshot wound to the abdomen, right? A gunshot wound. You've got, you know, uh, bowel throughout the abdomen and um, you have that repaired. And on day nine, the wound is, you know, looks like it's infected after having had your stomach blown open. NHSN calls that a surgical site infection. Our surgeons say, are you kidding me? So the idea of turning back to the provider, okay, so tell me what matters to you. What are the things that are important for you to tell me that you're high performing? And so it is, the Duke system is based on measurement, but we've got an agreement from these groups that these are measures that matter to them. And um, we just went through this with our spine surgeons. And that was a long conversation, right? But we, we begin by saying to them, you give us the data that you think confers clinical excellence on your outcomes and we'll build it. And so it was acknowledging that some of these publicly stated data uh, definitions don't resonate with clinicians. And unless we were willing to stop and understand their side of it, and let me just say, I'm not a surgeon, right? But I'll tell you, the American College of Surgeons is a pretty tough group of people. They're not letting many individuals off the hook. So they're, they're pretty rigorous. I'm not thinking, there's not a lot of layups. So, you know, I, I think what we did was we said to them, well, tell us what does matter to you. You know, what, what matters to you? When we started showing people in our, our focus groups, things like um, catheter-related urinary tract infections, they said, what are you talking about? You know, I don't know what that is. You say that to, to our born and, born and Durham Healthy for Life women's group, you know, show us your CLABSI data. They said, what do you, what, why would we be interested in that? Plus the prevalence of those conditions is so low, so low you know, on the order of 0.5%, that when we show that data publicly to our focus groups, they laugh at us. They say, why are you showing us that? I wanna know what happens if I have a heart attack. I wanna know what my five-year survival from lung cancer is. That's what I wanna know. And I wanna know, will you care about me? That's what the public is telling us. So we just use that construct to say, okay, let's build the data around that. What's the five-year survival from lung cancer at Duke? That's a pretty reasonable question. Well, so thank you, Rick. One question, I guess, to follow up with that is about clinical registry data and looking at individual physician outcomes and in terms of the risk adjustment. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, individual physician risk adjustment? Yeah, so um, this is done in a, a all by um, uh, NISQIP, right, through their algorithms, but basically, uh, an individual physician's risk adjustment is based upon 62 variables that go into the risk equation. Um, and you saw an example in the risk adjustment score about what some of those are, not all of them. And then, um, you know, if, so if you're operating on older, sicker Medicaid patients, those things are adjusted for in the model so that the expected outcome reflects that. So what the surgeons like about this is that it allows them to continue to push the envelope because if you're taking on more difficult cases, it's accounted for. And to do so with an opportunity toward learn, can you really achieve that outcome? So we have a lot of surgeons pushing back and saying, you know, all this tells us is we just operate on healthy people. And that's not who we see. So we had to accommodate that by really focusing in on the, the expected mortality piece of this using a 62 variable adjustment model so that we didn't discourage people from operating on sicker cases. But if you had a 50% mortality operating on sicker cases, you probably had need to rethink your case selection, right? There was so, so there was a window in which we said enough is enough. You know, there is futility but it created enough room that people felt like they could trust the risk adjustment. Great, thank you. Um, uh, other questions, I've got, I've, like I say, I've got lots of questions. We've got a few more minutes for this discussion. Um, anyone else wanna jump in? Otherwise I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. 
Hey, okay. David, let me just say one other thing. You know, um, these professional registries aren't cheap. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're not cheap largely because they're still all manually extracted, right? So we have like a SWAT team of nurses who I rather, I wish we're still seeing patients, but instead they're, you know, kind of extracting this stuff. Um, what I'd love to collaborate with you guys on is, you know, natural language processing capabilities to find those 62 elements in the health record, right? You don't need a nurse to find 62 data points. We ought to be able to use things like natural language processing to find the 62 measures and build them in. So I think there is a really, there's an opportunity to think about a much more cost-effective way to get the data than we do today. But I, I want that caveat, not cheap. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so there's the challenge to those who are involved in machine learning AI here at Stanford. That would be an awesome project. Um, well, let me let me hit on one thing. There's a word that you use, and you use this in your in your talk, and that is we, right? And let's talk a little bit about we because now we're within these you know complex, highly matrixed organizations. Um, and when I hear you say, you know, we have a team that goes and does that. When I heard you say we discovered that the bus schedule doesn't align with the patient schedules. And so we changed the schedule and all the things that, that we, I'm wondering who is the magical we, I, yeah. like how does this happen in an organization? How do you make it happen? How does it happen across the organization? So listen, we are one of the most siloed places in the world. Um, and the we here around that cache work was all about giving people a purpose. So as I said, we live in a, minor, a majority minority city. People at Duke have become incredibly aware of the disparities that we see in the world in which we live. And the events of last year galvanized people's interest. So we is a bunch of medical directors, you know, who were involved in peripheral quality projects, who had 25% protected effort, who said, I don't want to do this stuff anymore. I want to do that stuff. So they started to work on it. Uh, there are three or four quality directors in OB that said, you know, we don't want to do the old stuff. We want to do this stuff. So we trained them. We trained them in some basic lean methods. We have a coach deployed to the prenatal clinic who redesigned the bus schedule stuff, right? So these are medical directors in OB who have said, I'm interested in doing something meaningful in my life. And I actually think addressing maternal morbidity disparities would give me great meaning. So I would like to take my 25% effort and do it. So that's how these people came together as we. Um, we've got a list now of 21 um, different areas across Duke that said, can we get involved in cache? Can we bring our project forward? Can you find the community group for us? So, you know, the purpose around disparities has really brought the we together. Um, so I would think about purpose, right? What is that thing? Um, and, you know, Lane, I, I, always, I always sort of, you know, think about children's hospitals as places of great purpose. You know, it's very easy to get your hands around purpose um, there. And so, you know, I would say, David, Duke magically came together when we put our finger on something that suddenly struck a chord with our faculty, um, where suddenly people woke up and said, my God, maybe we're driving these disparities. And they got interested in looking. And then more importantly, it wasn't a research project, right? Define, measure, and improve. The idea was that nothing stops until we figure out how to fix the care delivery system. Now we've got some problems in that, you know, um, housing in Durham is not something easily fixed, right? That's gonna take a while to get our hands around that, but at least we understand what role it plays. Excellent, thank you. I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Um, in the chat, uh, Grizel had a question about caring. Grizel, you wanna come off mute and ask your question? Sure, hi, um, great presentation. And I'm curious to know um, when, the, when the population or your, your customers were saying that they wanted, they, they wanted you to care for them, what are your human-centered caring strategies that you're utilizing to care both for them and for your staff? Yeah, it's an excellent question. You know, I was stunned. Um, every place I turned, all I heard was, 
you know, Duke's a good place, we'll get good care, but we would like you to care about us. Um, and it's this, you know, historical notion here in the South that, you know, we haven't always been very good uh, at being fair and equitable. Um, you know, I came from the University of Virginia, which has a, an extraordinarily challenging past uh, with respect to race and ethnicity. So we've really focused as part of the improvement piece of this in our clinics, building cultural competency through the Duke REACH program. So this is training exercises that staff and faculty go through in those domains about how to be culturally competent, how to recognize what it's like to walk in the shoes of someone who has to take three buses to get to an appointment, to begin to understand that if that person's late, it's probably worth some exception, right? Our frontline staff would just get angry at people and say, oh, you know, you're late, we got to reschedule you. But wait a minute, did you realize I just took three buses to get here? So building into the improvement piece of the work is cultural competency. Understanding what it means to be a Latinx woman or an undocumented person at Duke. You know, when we ask people about their race and ethnicity, their question back to us, are you gonna use that against me? You know, so we, we had a lot, we had a lot of work to still do, but we built it into the fabric of the improvement exercise. So as we try to address the disparity, we build the cultural competency. It's early. I don't wanna tell you we've got this figured out. It works really well in maternal health where again, there's people just rally to the purpose. Thank well, you. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Grizel, for that excellent question. On that uh, uh, wonderful note, that positive note, I, I just wanna say thank you so much to Rick and thank you all for joining us today on this uh, outstanding thought-provoking discussion. I hope that this is a uh, start of a long collaboration yeah. uh, across the country. And um, I would love to think about some of these technical issues, some of the redesign questions, some of these really interesting uh, human-centered design questions. Lots of wonderful uh, opportunity, I think, to collaborate. Yeah, let's keep the dialogue open. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. Excellent. So thank you again, Rick, and thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon.